So you're going to start, Katja, and then you're going to give it to me. Yes, I'll start. I'm still waiting for uh, people uh, to come in. So I'm no, take your time. Participants coming in. Take your time. I'm just waiting for a cue for you to start. And welcome to those who are joining. So now everybody can hear us. We have 120 and counting participants. So we'll just wait for 30 more seconds, well, maybe five more seconds until um, the count slows down because it takes time for people to join it. Okay, looks like it's uh, ticking slowly now. So most uh, people are here. Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to wherever you are. We are uh, very pleased uh, to have Albert Merrifold with us today to talk to us about large orders and small markets. But before I um, give the floor to him, we have a couple of announcements. So the first one is um, there is a conference on the future of financial information that is organized by uh, Mihal Zielinski and our colleagues from Stockholm uh, Business School. And the information about the conference is on our website. The conference takes place next week virtually. So please go to Microstructure Exchange to um, get the link for the conference and to register. And we'll also circulate it in the newsletter. Um, the second one, uh, which we typically make at the end, but just uh, in case you log in early, our next talk is on a Monday. Um, so next week, because uh, there is a um, conference, the Microstructure Exchange talk will be on a Monday by Dmitry Muravyov. And so now I'll turn this over to Albert. We're very pleased to have you. And Albert will talk to us about large orders in small markets. Albert, the floor is all yours. Thanks, Katya. Uh, it's, uh, it's great to, to see you and all the others that are in this, um, in this particular webinar. Um, I can't see you. I hope you can see me. Um, it's, it's a very different experience from having you know, faces to stare at and judging uh, whether what you say is still making sense. Anyway, I'm going to do my best. Um, the Q&A is there for you to ask questions, and, uh, and I'll pick, uh, pick up some of the uh, questions with the help of Katja along the way, and, and my co-authors will also try to respond. Um, so this, this is a beginning slide of, uh, of, of Corona, obviously this horrible uh, image that uh, we'll, uh, we'll not, uh, not soon forget. And then you have this line showing the, the markets. And, and this is a picture from the Financial Times where um, basically uh, there, was a, there was an article uh, last month uh, uh, basically making the point that uh, markets are so different in terms of their liquidity. Uh, in, these, in these special conditions, but also uh, in general, you have these algorithmic market makers and, uh, and if markets become turbulent, it says, then uh, they automatically ratchet back prices, uh, their quotes or the size of the orders, et cetera. So it becomes quite a challenge to navigate those markets, uh, particularly if, you're, if you have a large uh, order to trade, uh, which you can't do in these, day, in these days uh, in the single go. So you have to chop it up in pieces uh, many of us have written about it and in industry, I guess uh, some of you are in industry, you know, you know all about it. You have to chop it up in pieces and feed it to the market sequentially. Uh, so, so how do you do that optimally uh, is what is in focus here. Um, and we have a mathematical model to, to exercise our minds through this. Um, now, what is really important that when you are the liquidity demander for this large order, you have to exercise your mind through whatever you choose to do, what the strategic response is of the other side of the market. And these are uh, the algorithmic market makers that, uh, that are quoted here in this Financial Times article. Uh, only then will you be able to, uh, to figure out what's going on and to, to, to make sure that you, that, you, um, that you ultimately execute. So this, this I'm broadcasting, uh, as, as you can, uh, you may be able to see from, uh, from the yoga studio of my girlfriend. Uh, it's empty now, uh, as, as nothing's, nothing's going on in, uh, in sports schools and yoga studios these days in Holland. Uh, but it's a pleasant place to be. And, and, uh, and I'm trying to, you know, with, with, uh, uh, with you, go through some mental asanas, so to say, in this room to get our, our minds around this, uh, this, this difficult strategic game between a a large liquidity demander uh, and, uh, and the market is operating in. Uh, we call it small markets because in some sense, there's no large 
other side of the market, uh, you're, you're sort of reaching different uh, end users who pick up part of your large order through these strategic market makers. Anyway, um, the, the paper is with Agostino Caponi and Hong Zhong Zhang, who are uh, online here too. Um, I've long been interested in this problem, uh, I've never been able to solve this mathematically, but these guys have just been wonderful. Uh, we, we managed to find a setting that we're reasonable, reasonably happy with that produces close form solutions on this, on this um, um, uh, problem. And, uh, and the credit really goes to, uh, to Agostino and, and Hong Zhong. I'm just a PR department here. Um, so what is the structure of the talk? A little bit of motivation. Then I'll give you the objective, so what, what we're after. Um, sketch the model. Uh, so, so this is a high-level summary of the model. Give you some details uh, to show that it's not just cheap talk um, results. Uh, so these are going to be propositions, and I'm going to zoom in on some of them. Um, calibration. This is, this is going to be really exciting, uh, because this is where we sort of bridge back to, uh, to, to today's markets and finally conclude. And it's all going to happen in the remaining 40 minutes or so. Motivation, I'm going to be real quick because I already said uh, uh, many things. Um, one observation, uh, and this is um, um, a picture I could find to make the point, is that uh, the markets have become increasingly intermediated in the sense that, you know, it used to be many individual or small investors um, in, in securities markets, but now it's increasingly large mutual funds insurance companies, um, uh, pension funds um, that, that manage uh, portfolios and, and send orders to markets. And what we have in focus here to set the stage is um, uh, you know, a, a, a plain vanilla liquidity need. So switch off all your, your, um, your thinking about large orders as being information motivated. It's interesting and it's a large part of the orders, and, but there's a large literature on that already. Uh, what, what is much less uh, analyzed is, um, is uninformed large orders that typically are needed to, uh, to convert a large position into cash because you simply need the cash right now. Okay, that's a liquidity demand. And I guess that's very, um, uh, very, very timely in today's Corona markets. Now here's Vajano's view. He says, you know, it's not a small subset of, of large orders that are uninformed. Uh, it's many of them because as, as a, as a group, um, institutional investors uh, have never uh, outperformed the market as a group. So there must be many uh, orders out there that are executed for reasons other than information. Uh, and these are reasons because you, you get redemption from your funds or you get inflow and, and, and you want to activate um, the money into securities markets, et cetera. So that's, that's very important to keep in mind throughout this talk. We're going to focus only on uninformed large orders. How do they trade? Well, here are some data points. Uh, this is one of my favorites. It's uh, Knight Capital was a, uh, a high frequency trader uh, that implemented new software. And some of you uh, remember, uh, there was still a, a bug in the software. So that software started to execute in some sense, large orders, um, uninformed because nobody um, knew there was still this, uh, this, 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 this bug in the code. And, and here is uh, how um, uh, the, the prices of the, securities they sold fared on that particular day. So they started selling um, uh, stocks uh, right from the beginning of the market. At some point they found out there was a, there was a bug. It took some time to stop the algorithm. And, and you can see on the stocks that they sold that it's sliding down initially and then it takes quite some time all the way until two o'clock for prices to recover. But they fully recover because this order flow was uninformed. So there's, there's a lot of data points on this, but. It, one, one other data point that I want to show you is um, this is a study that studies 7 million meta orders of institutional investors. This is the Able Nozer data set for those of you who, who know it. Um, so what, what you see here is, is a lot of information, too much. Um, but what is on the horizontal axis is the time uh, during which the order executes. And these are for buy orders. So large buy order executing. Uh, over um, over uh, some time uh, denoted by the by the y axis uh, the x axis I should say, and on the y axis you see the price impact, 
and and it's not surprising that if you if you send a large order and execute it in, in, in a time interval or, or with some duration that's the term we're going to use the prices are going to run away from you so here you see prices rise but what is interesting is that um before you're done executing prices seem to come back already right so, so there, there is this um, um uh, curvature in these graphs and uh, and, and prices rebounding um before the, the execution is over that's that's and i'd like to call this the fireworks graph uh, and that's going to be uh, somewhat challenging to generate um, mathematically in an econ economic model but uh, but but we'll, we'll be able this is going to be one of the pr products of the of the model we'll be able to generate this type of graph as i'll show you later um, then there's this graph that you know if you look at the cross-section of all of those large orders typically uh, again it's a very dense graph but what it what it communicates is that for orders that last a long time the uh, intensity of the order is going to be low. And for orders that last a short time, the intensity is going to be high. And that's a, that seems to be a monotonic uh, condition. So that's in this graph here. Um, um, so that, those are some data points that, uh, that we'll get back to because we, we, the, the, for, the, for the primitive model, for the primitives that we set up and that we solve, we actually can generate these patterns. Uh, more motivation, regulatory pressure, um, the third bullet point here is my favorite. Um, so the SEC since 2016 demands open-end funds to report on the liquidity of what they're holding. And, and the way they need to report that is on days to cash. Uh, and this is again, you know, emphasizing that, that um, the time dimension of liquidity. Um, so how many days do you need to, uh, to um, uh, unwind your portfolio uh, at a, a preset uh, uh, price impact, I guess? Um, the ESMA, so the European uh, counterparty, uh, a counterpart of that um, uh, of, of the SEC, uh, hasn't produced strict rulings, but some ad ad advice. Um, now, when there's regulatory pressure, there's immediate in industry response in um, in helping um, all these institutional investors out with um, figuring out what the price impact is of their um, uh, of unwinding the portfolios or their large trades. And this is one example, MSCI liquidity service, um, where uh, the, the larger point of this graph is that, um, so on the Z axis, you see the price impact. Then you see one of the horizontal axes, the size of the order. And if you, if you, if you focus on the time horizon of zero, that's essentially a static impact. And, and, and there's a lot of literature on that. Um, and, and of course, if, um, if it's like negligibly small, the order you're executing, you, you're, you're gonna, your execution loss is going to be the half bid ask spread. But the moment you execute more, you're going to move along that size line there and you're going you're gonna to suffer a larger price impact. But if you take some time to execute the order, you're going to move along the time horizon and you're going to you know, reduce your price impact. Um, and that's uh, in, in, the, um, in the terminology of MSCI that's called market elasticity. Uh, I prefer uh, for that to be called market resilience or something. Um, but this is a beautiful graph and I think this, this emphasizes that duration um, uh, dimension of uh, liquidity that, that, that's known. Uh, of course, it's in, in the literature, but I think under-researched. And that's what we're going we're gonna to zoom in on. Um, so I'm going to produce for you this graph, but then off of an economic model. So let me just go through the uh, next slide, which are the objectives of the study, and then I'll pause for questions, and then, uh, and then we'll go from there. So what are the questions that we're going to have uh, here? Uh, first question is, uh, how, how liquid is the market uh, for a large seller, uninformed, and let me emphasize again, uh, who, is, who is only time constrained? Uh, so he has like, an, let's say, uh, an infinite position to sell, uh, and, and what is crucial for him is that he knows he's, he's got 50 minutes to do it or two hours or two days H how much can he get rid of uh, optimally um in uh, in the market that's gonna it's gonna be the, the analysis that i'm gonna present for you uh so the moment he has that constraint he knows it's gonna be 50 minutes that he's in the market for should he reveal it i'm not gonna emphasize that in, in this study that's that's gonna be called um um, um uh, so we have sunshine trading and um and uh, I'm forgetting the term here, but uh, but we'll, we'll we'll see it as we as we go here uh, as we go. But that's not going to be a focus. We're going to focus on sunshine training, meaning that um, somehow the large seller is able to communicate um, the time constraint to the to the market. 
Um, to market makers, so this this is a more holistic uh, view of the of, of, of transaction quality or the or, or, or the securities markets quality. We're so focused on um, on that large liquidity demand and its cost and its optimization that we're sometimes forgetting that you know for for a holistic view, you also have to look at the quality of a market when there's a large seller uh, for for the market makers. Is that a good thing that there's every now and then a large seller in the market, or the other people that ultimately uh, pick up um, bits and pieces of that large order because that, that they essentially trade with the market makers in turn. Um, are they better off with uh, with there being a large seller or no? And this sort of gets more closer to a to a total quality picture of the market, or or if you want, call it welfare. Um, so we're going to have that in focus too. Uh, socially optimal outcome. I'm, I'm going to de-emphasize that here, and we're going to calibrate um, the uh, the model to the um, um, uh, to the data. Let me stop here and, and, and look at Katja to see if, uh, if there's still anybody there. Yes, I'm here and uh, we had comments in the chat saying people are here too. So people okay. are here. There are almost 200 participants. On this note, I'm realizing that I forgot to remind uh, uh, everybody about the rules of the game. Um, so we have about 45 minutes for Albert to speak and Albert will pause uh, a couple of times during the talk to take up questions from the Q&A. So if you have a question during the talk, please send it through a Q&A function and there is also an upvote um, function in there. So if you have a question that you like, please don't type a new one, but just uh, like the question and then it'll go up to the talk. And during the talk, I'll read these questions to Albert and Albert will answer. And Agostino, I believe, is there answering them um, in the chat in real time. And after the talk, we'll take the questions live through the raise hand function. And so on this note, um, the first question was from Charles Jones, uh, which uh, asked, I think, um, during the empirical facts uh, presentation, is it common knowledge that these traders are uninformed? In, in the model, it is. In the model, it's common knowledge that the, um, that the traders are uninformed. So the, um, uh, this is just one step towards a more complete model where there's also information asymmetry. But we have to start some the dynamics get pretty complicated already with uh, switching off information asymmetry and fundamental value. So then we have a question from uh, Panke Jane. Um, historically upstairs, it's a longer question. <laughs> historically upstairs markets in New York provided a market clearing mechanism for uh, large orders separate from the regular downstairs markets for smaller orders. Haven't algorithms and automation affected both upstairs markets for large orders and downstairs markets? Or is there cross-pollination among the two that is different with algos that was, uh, there's basically, is the algorithm dif trading different from uh, the human touch mechanisms that existed prior? I mean, these are great, great questions, guys. Um, um, so, so this is, um, you know, my thinking, my current thinking on this is that, um, um, no, uh, it's not so different uh, because what you have in the marketplace, and I, I've, I've met several people in the industry that work for market making firms where uh, there's still some um, a quote uh, that you can get from them on, uh, on, on the immediate execution of that large order. And in a way, what's happening then is that the market making firm uh, takes over the large position and starts to use its technology to unwind it in the market. But then the same economics apply. Now it's the large, now it's the market making firm that's executing the large order and has to think about how are the other gonna, others going to be re responding strategically when I start to work this through the market. Next question is from Evangelos Benes. Is your model more relevant for exchange-based base trading than for over-the-counter trading? I'm asking because in several over-the-counter markets, the price impact is declining with trade size. No, yeah, it's very, it's very different. Yeah, let me, let me uh, not claim here that we have something to say about over-the-counter markets. They're very different. Uh, you have a request for quote systems, et cetera. Uh, this is for, uh, for markets where you have a, a central market. Okay, the model is just a central limit order market that everybody uh, interacts with. So we'll take one more question uh, from Dmitry Muravyov. Um, why all those are so committed to executing orders within a day? This seems to be a big friction. Why don't practitioners stretch the execution window to several days? 
That, that would be, uh, you know, um, uh, maybe first best, but sometimes there are other reasons for why you need to um, uh, execute it quickly. Uh, for example, I've been working on CCPs. Uh, in, in a, if, if the CCP, um, uh, you know, um, uh, um, is in a, in, in, a, in a situation that one of their clearing members fails on them, they have to unwind their portfolio within a pre-specified time window. That's, that's going to be their regulators that impose it on them. So sometimes there's you know, reasons outside of the model for which there are uh, um, reasons for why uh, there is a limited time window. So there is one last question from Barbara Rindi, uh, which gives you also a segue into the model. You asks how liquid is the market for a large seller who is only time constrained. Um, that usually depends on the liquidity of the stock and does your model take uh, care of this? So after yes. this question, I think you'll just go into the model and I'll stop the video and mute myself. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Barbara. So this is, this is a good way to get to the next uh, deck of slides because it's going to be very s precise on, on what I mean by, um, by, by, by liquidity and in particular how the market structure comes into play. Um, so here's the model sketch. Um, and this is going to be one slide with the bullet points of the model and one slide graphically illustrating the model. Then we're going to get you know, all the nitty gritty details. But I, I found it useful also for my own understanding to first force myself to put everything in a single slide and then unfold from there. So the model sketch is the following. So we have a, a, a strategic trading by a large seller. Uh, needs to trade a large position uh, in finite time. And we're gonna uh, call that duration uh, in, in, the, in the remainder. Um, then there's gonna be um, a strategic trading by Kuno competitive market makers. Um, and they're gonna be responding to the first mover and the first mover in this game is the large seller. So it's a stackable structure that buys us uh, tractability. Um, information, very important, asymmetry on order duration in principle. So, so when I'm the large liquidity demander, I privately know what my duration is. Like, uh, do I have to sell within 50 minutes, two hours, or, or within a week? Uh, and and it, it's really um, uh, not, not clear um, uh, for, for market makers who see maybe the first uh, uh, bit of that order being executed in a market, how long it's gonna last. And this, you know, this is something that I've always been excited about putting in the model. Because that's, you know, my interactions with, with market makers, uh, frequency market makers uh, has always been um, 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 uh, convincing me that we're, we're missing out on one important dimension in, in, in many of our models, which is there's, it's very hard for market makers to predict how long uh, the directionality, as they call it, in the market is going to last. They see that there's going to be, you know, a, a large seller because they, have, uh, they experience a lot of selling. Uh, on their books, but they don't know how long it's going to be, going to be lasting. And, and that's, uh, that's, of course, first order importance for them uh, when deciding to take on more of that order uh, or, uh, or stop basically uh, putting more, more of that order onto their books. There's information symmetry of fundamental value, very important. This is the sense in which the large order is uninformed. So everybody here uh, knows about the fundamental value and how it, how it moves through time. So that's, there's nothing interesting there. Um, um, time is continuous and runs forever. Um, now here are the graphs. Um, so you have here, uh, there's a couple of graphs here. Um, the first one is trades. Um, so horizontally runs time, and then, uh, and then you see trades or um, appearing on the, on the, um, the y-axis here. And um, the, the large seller in our model is going to decide a trade intensity and is going to stay at that intensity for the entire duration. Okay, so you see that graphically here. Uh, the duration uh, is the D, and, and this is the, uh, the large seller selling in the market. Of course, that needs to be picked up by uh, others. Uh, so ultimately, these are going to be Poisson arrivals of, uh, of small investors who arrive at the market uh, and uh, look at the prices and decide how much they, um, they trade. Uh, and in between these two are going to be the market makers. So, so to make the markets clear, you have you need to have the uh, the market makers picking up the uh, the difference and, and here is that illustrated so this is the graph the position of the market makers as a group and as you notice it uh, it goes up linearly initially because there's um, a, 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 a selling by the by the large seller alone at a fixed rate and then when you see the first large buy invest 
just to come and, 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 and do a trade. You see that, um, that the market makers are, um, are unwinding some of their inventory. Now, all of this is, uh, is happening because of prices. Uh, so the bid and ask prices, they come out endogenously from the model. Uh, and all of these prices that I'm going to show uh, to you are going to be uh, relative to fundamental values. So, so the relative prices. Um, um, so this is the summary of the model. It should give you an idea of, uh, of, of how um, uh, the model works. So what are the nuts and bolts, um, the details? And, and this is just to give you a flavor uh, for how it's all technically working. The security, nothing interesting here. It's a, it's a fundamental value, uh, M, uh, that's a Brownian motion uh, with some uh, sigma, some volatility. End user investors, they arrive as Poisson uh, guys, and they're gonna, if they arrive, they're gonna see the prices and, uh, and trade depending on what they see. And, and the way we model that is um, there's gonna be a reservation value. Um, um, and and um, um, if the ask price, for example, is at the reservation value of omega, they're not going to buy anything, as you see from this formula. But the moment it sinks below omega, they start buying more, uh, you know, um, proportional to how much it sinks below uh, fundamental value. Um, and the um, 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 so that's that's basically Poisson buyers. The Poisson sellers, uh, same thing also linear. And then we have a count process that counts the buyer arrivals and the seller arrivals. Um, the large seller is going to um, arrive at time zero. And at the beginning of time, he decides uh, his intensity um, uh, and he privately observes the duration. But then he's sort of committed to that intensity. That's, that's the way we can, uh, we can solve the model. A more general model would make his intensity a filtered process, but that's not what we have, we have here. We just, uh, the only thing you can choose is the intensity. And he picks that intensity F to uh, optimize uh, the, his revenue. Uh, so he also has a, has a reservation value of omega for his position and, and, and anything that he can sell uh, in excess of omega. Uh, so again, this is a relative price. Um, uh, when, when the price is minus omega, uh, he's not going to uh, earn anything, but when the when the bid price stays above omega, he's going to make uh, revenue, and, he, and he's going to maximize that revenue. Um, that's his that's his um, um, uh, choice variable. And then we have stealth trading where he keeps D hidden. That's what we're gonna, not going to talk about here. And sunshine trading when D is, D is revealed. The end market makers who who, who compete Cournot, uh, they trade in continuous time. Um, and, 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 and we only consider symmetric equilibria. Uh, that's in the tradition with the literature. Um, and what these market makers solve is this, this beautiful object here. Okay, so uh, just to give you a flavor of what this is, this is the, uh, the revenues, so the, the change in wealth. And that, rev that revenue uh, process is gonna be uh, driven by what they buy at these prices, at bid prices, that's this part and what they sell at the ask prices. And, and of course, on average, ask prices are gonna appear, are gonna be uh, higher than the bid prices and that wedge is gonna decide their, is gonna uh, make their, uh, create their profits. Uh, but of course, they dislike uh, inventory, um, uh, which has been um, uh, modeled in a quadratic uh, flavor. Um, so I is inventory and ADA is the dislike of inventory or, or risk aversion, if you will. So that's what the market makers are doing. And the way we, we find uh, equilibrium in this model is uh, we solve backwards. Uh, so we first solve the dynamic program of the, uh, of the market makers, uh, the Cournot competitors, in the presence of F, which they observe right from the first DT. So they, that's important to emphasize here. So when the large seller starts executing, he, he picks F and, and the market makers immediately see the intensity. They sort of feel it uh, or their, their algorithms sniff it out. But they don't know how long it's going to last for in general. But here uh, in, in the Sunshine case, we know, we, we sort of assume that they, uh, that they know. And then once we have that solution, we can, uh, as a large liquidity de demander, sort of test for different values of F what the, um, uh, the, the expected revenue is going to be uh, given the market maker's response, because we've got the solution of their response to F. And that's the way we solve uh, this model. Uh, the base case of no seller is a byproduct because, um, um, well, let me not dwell on that. Um, 
So that's the way, uh, but before I go, I, I sort of noticed that in the process, I forgot the, uh, what's very important is the literature review. Um, and, uh, and I don't want to forget that because let me position. So now that you see the, the model, um, uh, how do we think about uh, adding to the literature? Well, there's a lot, a lot of literature on optimal execution with, uh, so in focus is the liquidity demander, but then the liquidity supply is exogenous, okay? And, and, and most Google sites at the moment, I guess, is Elmgren and Chris, but I could easily fill this slide with all the uh, papers on this particular problem. Many of you have participated, and therefore I emphasize at the top of the slide, this literature is incomplete. So that's got liquidity demand in focus, and liquidity supply is exogenous. Then we've got a set of literature where liquidity supply is in focus and endogenized with exogenous demand. Okay, uh, so it's Amiud and Mendelssohn, and I've worked on this with uh, Terry Hendershaw, um, and this is sort of a more general version of what we did in that paper. Um, there's very few papers on both, okay, and, and this is our attempt to endogenize both with this uh, Stackelberg structure. Uh, Pritzke, Rosteka, Beretka, uh, and I invite you, if we forget here, please uh, let us know, because we're, we're writing a new version and we want to have a complete literature. And of course, there's a larger literature on, on dynamic trading. Very exciting. Uh, everything here in this century. Um, uh, and many names that, uh, of course, Brunemeyer, Peterson, uh, uh, Chen, uh, Chen and Duffy, um, um, uh, Dwayne Seppi's got a paper, um, um, Kumar, uh, Venkataraman. So there's many papers out there. Let me stop here and, uh, and, and uh, um, give it back for uh, questions. So there are several um, clarification questions, I think. So I'll pull a couple. So Nicholas Houch asks, um, if I understand correctly, buy and sell intensity is opposed on an exogenous, and would it be more natural to assume that the seller changes his selling intensity in response to buying intensity on the other side? And there is a related question um, from Vincent Vancouver. Does the strategy of the large seller depend on the realization of the arrival of the other traders, or is it uh, completely deterministic? Yeah, I can be sure about that. These are great questions, and, and this would be a generalization of the model. Um, for the moment, we couldn't solve that model. So, so that's what I meant when I said the, um, the large seller's process is not a filtered process. He decides at the beginning of time, intensity, and then, uh, and then we go from there, and, uh, and, the and it's, it's already tricky to get, to get tractable results. But great points. A question uh, from uh, Thierry Foucault. Is the observation of F an assumption or a result? Um, that's a good question. It is an assumption. Let me point, you know, it's an assumption. Uh, Mario Zoykan is asking whether the private information is uh, just on duration or whether also it's on order size, the parent order size. It's, it's just, uh, it's a great question. Um, it's on, just on duration. And, and, and you know, to get, um, uh, get us starting on this model, we, we simply assume that the um, liquidity demand is, is large, in fact, so large that we have an infinite position to sell. Were we to sell everything in the market until this privately observed duration, we would you know, push the floor out of the market, so that's, that's immediately uh, uh, suboptimal. Uh, so the question is then, what should we sell? Um, Robert Krajcik asks, is F independent of the current deviation of prices from M? Uh, also a very good question. Um, for the moment, we're assuming we're in steady state when a large seller is arriving at the market. Um, so we haven't thought through what it means if you're out of steady state. But, uh, but, but that's a very interesting observation. I mean, there's, there's some work that, that Terry Hendershaw and Charles Jones and I did where we, uh, on actual data, where we saw that the strategic timing of large orders. Um, if you're interested, uh, send, shoot me an email. I can, I can give you that paper. So I think in the interest of time, we should uh, proceed further to the results. Yeah. And then uh, we'll also have some time for the raise hand questions. Yeah. So. Um, the, the results. So a couple of propositions. Um, if there is um, no large seller, um, so that's sort of a baseline case. There's no large seller. There's just um, the um, um, uh, the market making by these strategic Kuno uh, market makers. Uh, then there is a unique equilibrium, is what we show, uh, and bid out spread, spreads are um, are uh, as follows. So theta is is essentially a vector with all the primitive parameters. 
And what you see is uh, that the, 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 the ask and the bid prices, so the top and the bottom equation here are going to be, uh, uh, so the prices straddle around fundamental value. Uh, and they become pressured in the in in the direction of uh, of uh, uh, basically the um, the, uh, the direction opposite of the inventory, and, and of course the uh, the interesting part is in these objects a theta and b theta how large are they and how do they depend on primitive parameters? There's already a lot of economics there, but that's already in the literature. We we don't have um, a bit of discussion in the paper. I don't have time for that now. But now now what's interesting is if this is the baseline, and we bring in the large seller. What's happening to uh, to the equilibrium? That's going to be uh, the next proposition. Um, there's still a unique equilibrium, uh, and bid-ask spreads are, uh, and this is this is in the presence of a large seller. Basically, the bid-ask prices are the same as in the first proposition. So when there's no large seller, except for uh, there's further price pressure. <clears throat> okay, this is a, a dummy. Uh, that's one when the, when we're still within the duration uh, period. So when T, uh, the time is within uh, the, uh, the duration, so, so until the duration, we of course have the, uh, the extra uh, pressure of uh, the large seller F. Uh, and then there's gonna be a function here that's, um, uh, that's, that's again, a, a, a close form uh, function of uh, how long it still is until um, um, the, uh, the large order is done executing. So this is the sunshine trading. Uh, and what is interesting is that this is not going to be so this is not surprising because if in this period where the large seller is executing we have additional sell pressure so the prices slide further is not surprising what is somewhat surprising is that the bid price slides further out than the ask price, ask price meaning the bid ask spread become elevated in this period and this is um, one of the reason of the uh, one of the outcomes of the soft competition of the Cornell market makers. And, and how much that um, spread is elevated is basically determined by this, uh, by the closed form solution here of the, uh, of the, of the primitive parameters. Proposition lemma five. Um, and this is coming out of the, the optimization. Okay, so, so, then, so then you have a solution for every D. Uh, so you can solve that. And what you notice is that for the short durations, the large, it's optimal for the large seller to sell at higher intensity than for the long durations. In fact, this is a monotonic function. Uh, and this comes back to that empirical, uh, the data point that I showed you earlier, that intensity is negatively uh, related to, uh, to duration. So we get that out of the model here. Um, maybe not so surprising, but it's nice that it comes out. Um, and this is this is somewhat more surprising to me. Um, um, so so this is that other. Remember that question of when we have that large seller in the market relative to a case when he isn't there and it's just those Poisson guys. Uh, is this a good situation for the market makers? Uh, is it good that there is, in some sense, a, a fat, hungry guy in the market that wants to be fed? Um, you would think yes. Um, you know, there's additional demand. So. But that's not necessarily the case. Uh, and the reason is that um, they, 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 they are ultimately picking up the order and, uh, and suffering negative utility because they're risk averse. So only if uh, risk absorption capacity in the market is high enough, meaning risk aversion is low, ADA, uh, there's a, you know, a lot of these market makers there, uh, or, or the arrival of, of, of Poisson guys as alumni is high, do we see that, uh, that it's good for market makers to see those large orders? Um, uh, so it's not it's not in general the case that uh, with an with an extra demander uh, in the market it's good for market makers and the reason is that they're sort of experiencing a, a directional uh, market uh, for some time, um, um, which which they have to cope with. Um, the other one is uh, okay. So then we've got the market makers. We've got some results on the market makers. How about um, the um, the other people at the other side of the market that ultimately pick up pieces of these orders or, or the Poisson guys as we'd like to call them. Um, are they better off? Well, again, here it's it's a non-trivial result. Uh, you would think that yes. I mean, in, in, in some sense, if they uh, become the marginal buyer, because there's more people, or, or to the extent that they, that they come, that if they have an appetite to buy, they buy more on depressed prices. If they have an appetite to sell, they sell less on depressed prices. So, so there's more buying than selling by these for some guys. 
and uh, and and given that there's more buying, uh, if you buy at lower prices at depressed prices, that ca that cannot be but good, right? So so it must be good. But then there's the ca counter effect of remember what 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 was coming out of Proposition Two that the bid ask spread becomes elevated in that um, um, period that the large seller is selling. That's going to be uh, a negative also for the Poisson guys. They they don't like bid spreads, uh, large spreads. So what, so what we find there is um, that the large seller um, presence only uh, benefits these end investors only if, uh, is, if in fact that large seller sells at super high intensity so that the price pressure effect dominates the larger bid off spread effect. Um, social planner, no time for that. Um, um, calibration results, yeah, let me move on to the calibration results and then uh, conclude and then we'll open up for uh, for questions i have uh, you know five five more minutes or so um so, so then we uh, we've got this model and then we calibrate it to uh, to the market um, um and and here uh, i've uh, i've come back to an to an old paper of mine on, on new market makers where uh, and the reason i'm going there because that had very detailed and granular data on a, on a, on a, on a, high, on a large high frequency trader. And, and off of that um, data, we can calibrate a couple of the, the, the parameters. Um, uh, for one, um, we would be able to compute what the reservation value is of, uh, of um, uh, the Poisson guys. Um, that's gonna be 13.6 basis points to the Omega. So in, so in an interval of, what is it, 27.2 uh, basis points around fundamental value, that's where people are, are hungry for trade. Outside of that interval, you're not gonna trade with these large, with, uh, with anyone, is what this uh, particular data suggests. Number of trades per day, in this case, this is a year and X stocks, uh, 791. Average duration, if, it, if the intensity is five, that's one over five is the average duration, that's about two hours. Um, I think, you know, in, in, in empirical work of uh, Bob Krajcek and, uh, and, 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 and Vincent van Kervel and I have, have, have a similar paper. Uh, we also find that the duration is, uh, is two hours, three hours for, for many of the orders. That's sort of the median. And there's, there's others. So the risk aversion is uh, on a position of average volatility of 1,000 euros. You want to have a 0.1 basis point, um, um, basically disutility, uh, pecuniary dis disutility, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we have that uh, calibration. And, and, and if you... If you then produce the same graphs that I showed you earlier, remember that motivation graph? I'm just gonna repeat that graph here, but then on, on real data and, and, and a solved model. So there's gonna be the top, which has got trade rate, middle has got positions of the market makers, and the top, bottom one has got prices. So that's what I showed you earlier. This is gonna be uh, what the model, uh, after solving it in the calibration, is gonna produce for, for real data. Um, so here, the, the, the you know, we, we pick a, a, an average size order, which is, uh, if the intensity is five, it's gonna be 0.2. Um, that, that's roughly uh, two hours of trading. Um, here you see the large seller is selling it. So look at the solid lines here, because the, the dotted lines are the stealth equilibrium. This is the sunshine equilibrium, where, where uh, somehow D is learned uh, by the market makers. Um, so you see the, the large seller, you see uh, that the others are selling a bit, but, uh, but most, most of the others are buying. And this is uh, you know, the, what I was saying earlier, that for some guys like to buy on depressed prices uh, on the margin. Um, positions of market makers, uh, you can see that they shoot up. And, and if you're interested, if, if D is gonna be uh, uh, kept hidden, the market makers are less uh, um, uh, inclined to take on inventory. Um, and that's what you see in the wedge between the two. I didn't have time for the stealth case, but what, what, is, what is striking is how much more market makers are willing to take on when they have a way of predicting the duration of the orders. And finally, uh, prices. Uh, here you see uh, zero is, uh, is, is, is the fundamental price, if you will. So, that, so again, bid and spreads are relative to fundamental. Uh, at time zero, um, market makers see uh, that the large seller is executing they immediately slide their prices uh, down because they know it's part of a larger order for longer duration. Um, and then um, in, in the sunshine case or when the duration is known, what is, what is, so you see the ask and the bid price, but what is interesting is that prices go down while the order is executing, but look, at some point they start going up. And that's the outcome of the, of the dynamic trading of the, of the market makers. 
um, they, they're going up um, and it's a both both the bid and the ask price um, and there is there is a bit of discontinuity here and this is that part remember where there's additional pressure on the bid quotes when the large seller is executing so these this bid ask spread is wider than this one might be hard to see here but that's that's what it what's the case but remember the fireworks graph that i mentioned we have it here in the model so that prices start to be become depressured depressured uh, before the execution is over, uh, whereas the large seller keeps selling at the same intensity. Um, so um, um, in this particular case, what's the impact on others? In the calibration, I remember that was a threshold result uh, for, for your blue chip stocks in Euronext trading. Uh, it seems that market makers benefit from large orders um, because the risk capacity exceeds the, uh, the threshold, the risk capacity of the market makers. And other investors benefit also because the, 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 the amount by which the prices become pressure dominates the extent to which the spread widens. Uh, so this is all good. You expect if you go through smaller stocks or medium sized that there is a dislike of market makers and potentially of other investors of, uh, of large orders. Uh, that's you know, further work that we did on this calibration showed that that's indeed the case. And you know, coming back to Corona markets or COVID-19 markets, um, we find very different results here um, for, for blue chip stocks because there might be fewer market making firms that might become, might have become mis uh, more risk averse. Um, maybe there's a bit more trading by Poisson guys, so the intensity goes up. But what's interesting is that you can change all of these parameters in the model and you'd be able to predict as regulators, but also as industry participants, what the, uh, what the price impact is going to be in conditions that you've not seen before. So finally, um, I did that uh, MSCI plot uh, as a motivation. Remember this one, that, um, that the price impact is a, um, is a three-dimensional beast. Uh, it depends on the size of your order, but, but crucially on the time you take to, uh, to execute it. Um, so, as you can imagine, we could we can generate that same graph here because we've got that model solved and 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 calibrated. And if you do that for that particular stock for Euronext at the, at the time when everything was normal, uh, you'd find something like this. Um, so this is you know for for lack of a better term, this is Caponi Mengfeld uh, Zhang liquidity servant CMZ, uh, and and turns out to be huge, very steep. Um, um, for, um, uh, for, for orders that get executed, large orders. So this is percentage of ADV, okay? Average daily volume. Um, so, so very quickly, if you're 1% average daily volume and you wanna do it like in infinite decimal time, you're gonna, you're gonna be uh, seeing and uh, experiencing a steep impact. That levels off quite quickly if you take a half a day or a full day. But the extent to which that curvature uh, is there is of course dependent on the primitive parameters. And that's the beauty of having an economic model that you can do all your, uh, your, your calculations, figuring out how you wanna turn your securities into cash, et cetera. Uh, conclude, I'm gonna, you know, it's, uh, it's time. So, uh, so there's two bullet points here for the moment. Um, I didn't have time for that, but it, it turns out that sunshine trading uh, dominates stealth. And the way we, we don't believe here, let me clarify that uh, people are going out there st telling everybody and how long they're in, in the market trading for. Uh, but but they but maybe what's happening here, if they trade a particular order at an intensity, a particular duration order at a particular intensity in a monotonic way. So if you do the 50 minute order at one percent ADV intensity and a two hour order on uh, half uh, ADV intensity, uh, 0.5 percent ADV intensity, et cetera, et cetera. If that's if that's a um, uh, the way you trade then of course the market maker is gonna learn. And so uh, they're gonna be able to predict uh, if they see the, the intensity at which you're trading, how long the order is gonna last. And in that sense, you know, this, this might be um, um, approximately the equilibrium that we're finding here. Nobody communicates anything, but the market makers simply learn in the Sunshine case. And, and the second point is, and then I'll stop, is um, the large seller being there. So, so adding a liquidity demand on one side of the market that's large is not necessarily good news. Uh, for market makers, nor is it good news for, uh, for, for the other people in the market. Um, it's only good news if there's enough risk capacity in the market uh, and, uh, and, and if the large seller really wants to trade high intensity. 
Um, so let me stop here and pass over to Katja. Thanks all for being here. Um, we're going to have more Q&A going on if you have to leave. Uh, we can correspond later uh, through email. Uh, please reach out. We, we're writing a new version of the paper and your input is going to be super valuable. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Albert. And uh, we'll now go through uh, live uh, Q&A through the raise hand function, which should be enabled. But before we do that, there are a couple of questions in the chat. And so um, the top one is from Thierry. And uh, Thierry, I, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself right now and ask your question in person instead of me reading it. Uh, hi, Albert. How are you doing? Hi. Okay. Uh, yeah, my question is maybe, you know, to what would be interesting to do is to show a benchmark where market makers are competitive, uh, price takers, they submit demand function, just to separate what is coming from uh, strategic behavior from what is coming simply from anticipation of the large order coming in the future. Because in this type of situation, you are going to have price effects, which simply reflect the fact that people know that there is more to come. And I guess some of the price effects you see are, are not driven by strategic consideration, just by anticipation, basically. Very good point. Thanks, uh, Thierry. Um, um, that's something that, uh, that, um, that we, we, we need to do. And, and it's a nice way of separating, it, separating out what's coming from the Cournot versus what's not coming from it. Um, and in a way, we've done some of this by bringing N, the number of market makers, to infinity. And uh, all the results are in, in the direction that you'd expect. Um, uh, but there's still going to be price pressure um, because as a group, they need to pick up the, uh, the, the position. Thanks. So I see some raised hands. Uh, Penke, I yeah. should be able to, be able to speak. Yeah, can you hear me now? No. Yeah. yeah, so I have the... Uh, question about this uh, high frequency traders or uh, uh, market makers. I mean, if everything is revealed to them, I mean, maybe that's what they're taking advantage of uh, uh, with order detection strategies and the back running and those things. And that's why a lot of exchanges install the speed bumps on them. So what's your thought on how the sunshine versus the predatory trading by HFTs uh, will take place uh, in your model? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. And we've been thinking about this a lot. Um, and this is, of course, uh, you know, we have a bit of discussion in the current version of the paper of how we compare it to Brunemeyer and Peterson for, uh, you know, that's a paper on, on predatory trading. Um, what is crucially important is um, that these are uninformed orders. Uh, with with Brunemeyer and Peterson, you have a bit of permanent price impact. And the moment that's the case, uh, th there is a way to, uh, to make money off of uh, being faster than anybody else uh, because when you sell early along with the uh, with the large seller uh, you sell at, at prices that are still elevated relative to where you're going to land in our case we have a perfectly uninformed order so prices are going to be uh, you know back to where where they were and that that particular incentive is gone um, but what is important that is what i emphasized uh, and and here we're in, in company with many uh, theory papers is that we have uh, the, the the symmetric equilibrium in focus if you would, you know, emphasize, if you would unfold the dimension of, uh, of asymmetric uh, equilibria, um, uh, and, th and this is going to be hard, um, but, uh, but let's, let's uh, le for the moment, uh, reflect on it a bit. Uh, my, my suspicion is that um, um, you're going to have, you can't, get ha you can't have everybody praying because there's nobody uh, on the other side of the market. Uh, so you might have a situation where some, uh, prey and, and, and some don't and, and exactly where that threshold is um, is, uh, is is interesting, but that's not a focus here. Uh, we, we just wanted to contribute a, a small step in the direction of, uh, of understanding a strategic dynamic trading um, But the, in the larger research agenda. This is a very good question. This is a super interesting application um, Thanks, Pakai. The next question is from Gideon Salar. Hi, uh, Albert. I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit more on the feasibility of sunshine trading in the current trading environment. So the old literature on sunshine trading was at a period where a, a, a large institution could have actually contacted a specialist and say, look, we're going to trade a very large trade, could tell the brokers and the brokers would tell the specialist. 
But these days where everything anonymous, uh, you cannot contact the algorithm. And in fact, the HFT firms don't interfere with their algorithms and they don't have such heavy hand. So I'm wondering how would you operationalize sanction trading in the current trading environment? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. I, I get in. Um, um, so the way we, we started thinking about it is, and maybe the term is wrong uh, because it puts people on the wrong footing. Uh, so, so the way I, I rationalize this in current markets is, um, is the algorithms um, um, sniffing out or basically learning from the past uh, of, uh, of, a, of, a non, of, a, of a monotonicity where uh, short orders are going to trade at high intensities and, 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 and long orders are going to trade at low intensities. So the moment you're able to, to see what intensity an order is trading, um, if, you, if you have that map in mind, you can make a prediction on the duration. And, and that's the sense in which we believe uh, there is some transparency, uh, even though it's um, unwittingly maybe on the, on the side of the large seller, uh, but, 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 but the way he's trading, if, if you're trading that way, uh, the, uh, the other side of the market is going to learn. So in some sense, if I can understand your, your reaction, is that basically you're saying it's a difference between the institutions used as a simple linear ex execution algorithm that everybody knows can be sniffed immediately as opposed to some randomized elaborate execution algorithm. Uh, so that choice of the institution between two types of execution algorithm could deliver the difference between sunshine and steel. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Gideon. Next question is from Mao Ye. Hi, Abra. Can you hear me? Hi, Mao. Hi. Yeah. Uh, actually, Love um, to <laughs> actually, my question is uh, pretty, uh, uh, pretty closely related to Gideon's question. It's like, a, I think uh, if I understand your model correctly, so I think for design algorithms, there are two ends. Some people try to hide from other people's uh, uh, order flow. Uh, that's probably incentive. There's a benefit of that. And I think uh, my understanding of your model is like your model prov uh, provided the answer to the other end. It's like there's a benefit of using mechanical trading algorithms. Uh, that's something very similar to some that shine trading. Is that something in your mind? Yeah, I, I get bits of pieces, so I, I sort of have to algorithmically decipher your uh, your uh, your question. Um, but what I, what I I'm just assuming that you're asking about um, um, yes, I mean there's, there's so much focus on uh, hiding the order, and and yeah, we yeah, see yeah. all the reasons if if there's a large informed uh, seller, uh, and there's many of those orders as well. Let me let me be clear about that then there's no incentive whatsoever uh, to reveal any of what you're doing to the market because everybody's going to sniff it out, going to basically uh, hijack uh, the information that you privately have. Uh, this is the entire other polar end. Uh, just to make a point uh, that there, there, in some particular cases, it might actually be good for you that the market makers know how long you're in the market, make, uh, how long you're in the market for, um, because it helps them, you know, um, tune their own algorithms, their own responses, and 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 as you see, the prices start to adjust already when they know the order is about to end. Uh, and and because because of the the, the Stackelberg structure and the competition in the second stage, in the first stage you're going to benefit from you know the guys in the second stage having in some sense an easier way to dynamically optimize. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Actually, your your, your price trend uh, actually. The sort of review is like uh, the market maker sort of predicts that the order is going to come to the end, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mao. Okay, we'll take uh, one more question uh, before we conclude the formal part, and then Albert has agreed to stay for another um, couple minutes, 15 minutes, uh, if anybody has more questions. So, Artyom Niklutov. Uh, hello, Albert, do you hear me? Hi, Artem. Yeah, sure. Loud and clear. Uh, so, um, so I wanted also to follow up uh, maybe slightly from a different angle. So as you said, although your model is not designed for OTC markets, uh, in OTC markets, there's this hot debate about uh, hiding large trades through dissemination delays. Uh, and primarily the dealer's argument there is that front running, so basically um, uh, liquidity running away if you're too visible, 
so I guess in your equilibrium model, everybody in the sunshine case, you have this corner competition. So this is basically modeling the endogenous front running kind of how people uh, strategically respond to the fact that there is this order. So do some of your results on this sunshine case, and in particular how market makers are more willing to accommodate inventory, suggest, as you pointed out to Mao already, that maybe um, uh, actually extra visibility is good because um, for the markets. Yeah, so, so that's, that's, what, uh, that's what this particular um, 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 model is uh, is finding, and it, it not only finds it. It's it, it, if you calibrate it, you get a like how you you can put a number on it. That's kind of cool because we we solve the uh, the stealth trading case as well, uh, where you um, where you keep your duration hidden, and you know the way you're you're a theorist, so so you, so you might appreciate this. We we've we've modeled the duration as a um, uh, expansion uh, exp uh, exponential uh, distributed variable. So, so if you're 10 minutes into observing an order, there's nothing you learn because there's, there's no memory. Um, uh, so that, that is good uh, if, you, if you really want to hide how long you're in the market for. Uh, but that comes at a cost and, and how much that is, is what, uh, what the, what's in the paper. I, I don't have these numbers on top of my head, but, but it's a sizable cost of, of, of market is having huge difficulties on, on, on predicting how long the order is going to be in the market for. And it's it's sort of intuitive, right? I mean, if you're you're, you're happy to take on one more piece, if you know that you know the next instant of time, um, it's stopping because then then you can resell, and you want to resell in a, in, a, in a time when the the seller itself the seller himself is is gone, right? Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, for joining. So it's uh, 12 p.m. Uh, New York time and 6 p.m. in Europe. Uh, so we'll uh, conclude the formal part of the seminar here. And uh, once again, thank you for coming. Next week, we'll hope to see you all on Monday. It's just the change of the day. And Mitri Muraviov will be talking to us about institutional price pressure at the close, so please remember to register. Albert will be staying with us for a few more minutes, so if you have questions, please uh, raise your hand through the raise uh, chat, uh, raise hand function, and uh, then unmute yourself. Thank you again for joining.